Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic, the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The subarachnoid hemorrhage. The circle of villus and the arteries which supply the brain are present in the subarachnoid space. And therefore, if there is a dilatation of the arteries known as aneurysms and they rupture, they cause bleed in the subarachnoid space. So the bleed in the subarachnoid space usually due to rupture of aneurysms is the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The presentation of subarachnoid hemorrhage is very very interesting. Unlike the intracerebral hemorrhages, subarachnoid hemorrhage may not present with neurological deficit because the blood is in the subarachnoid space. And very interestingly, they present with severe headache, often described as the worst headache of my life. Why should subarachnoid hemorrhage have severe headache? unlike intracerebral hemorrhages which may have headache or may not have headache. To understand this, we need to know the pain sensitive structures. Not all structures in the cranium are pain sensitive. In fact, brain does not have any pain sensitive structures. Even if the brain is cut, there is no pain. It is only the meninges which are pain sensitive. The meninges and the vessels usually in the meninges they are pain sensitive and therefore anything which irritates the meninges or infects and inflames the meninges will cause headache for example meningitis causes headache because it infects and inflames the meninges likewise subarachnoid hemorrhage will cause headache because it is an irritation in the meninges subarachnoid layer so the usual Two causes of headache from the neurologist's point of view is meningitis and subarachnoid hemorrhage. So brain, brain does not have any pain sensitive structures and therefore if there is hemorrhage in the brain per se like putamen or pons or thalamus or cerebellum, they usually do not produce headache. They may produce headache when there is raised intracranial pressure and then if the meninges are affected. So as long as they are in the brain only per se, they do not produce headache because brain per se has got no pain sensitive structure. So this is a very very important point. So the classic presentation of subarachnoid hemorrhage may be sudden headache in the absence of neurological deficits. Sudden headache in the absence of neurological deficits. And the sudden he headache, there may be a precipitating factor, precipitating cause, usually due to physical exertion. Because of physical exertions, the aneurysms may rupture. So there could be a history of physical, uh, history of physical exertion in the form of playing some games or a physical relationship, or it could be anything which, which increases the physical exertion and causes the aneurysm to rupture. So excluding head trauma, if we exclude head trauma, the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is the rupture of the sacral aneurysm or very aneurysm. So after head trauma, the most common cause and important cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is rupture of the sacral aneurysm or very aneurysm. Aneurysms is nothing but dilatation of the arteries. There are basically two types of aneurysms. The sacral aneurysm, that is the outpouching of the aneurysm or the fusiform aneurysm where there is a circumferential widening of an artery. So, when the artery ruptures, it causes subarachnoid hemorrhage. Where do we see this subarachnoid hemorrhage? It is seen in the subarachnoid space, but it is more commonly seen in the anterior circulation as compared to the posterior circulation. It is more common in the anterior circulation as compared to the posterior circulation. In fact, it occurs at the branch points and, and it ruptures. So it occurs where the artery branches, either bifurcation or trifurcation. It occurs at the branch points and then the ruptures. 
and usually it is associated with autosomal dominant uh, polycystic kidney disease. So the aneurysm, the common site of aneurysms is in the anterior circulation as compared to the posterior circulation. They occur at the branch points and they tend to rupture. So what are the three common sites where it occurs at the branch points? One, the common site, the commonest site is in the terminal internal carotid artery. So the commonest site of aneurysm is the internal internal carotid artery followed by NCA bifurcation as I said. It is it occurs at the branch point, so middle cerebral artery bifurcation and then the top of the basilar artery. So these are the common sites of the aneurysm which can rupture and cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. The clinical manifestations, I said that the presentation is sudden headache in the absence of neurological deficits. This is the usual presentation and one of the commonly asked NCQ questions in the exam. But then some aneurysms can present with focal neurological deficits. For example, posterior communicating artery aneurysm, the aneurysm in the cavernous sinus or the anterior cerebral artery aneurysm. The PCOM aneurysm, the posterior communicating artery aneurysm where it, it comes off from the internal carotid artery, when it dilates, it can go and impinge on the third cranial nerve which comes from the midbrain. The third cranial nerve supplies all the extraocular muscles and in addition it has got the parasympathetic supply to the pupil which runs superficially on the third nerve. So any extraneous compression like uncle herniation or posterior communicating artery aneurysm which goes and compresses the third nerve, it is a parasympathetic fibers which are the first to get affected and therefore since the parasympathetic fibers causes constriction of the pupil since they are affected, there is pupillary dilatation. So one of the common presentation of the PCOM aneurysm, posterior communicating artery aneurysm is the compression of the third nerve, especially the parasympathetic fibers which run superficially on the nerve, third nerve causing dilatation of the pupil. If there is an intrinsic pathology of the third nerve like diatus which, which affects the center of the nerve, it usually spares the superficially placed parasympathetic fibers and therefore the diatic third nerve palsy is usually called, called as a pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. But in compressive lesions and extraneous lesions like posterior communicating artery aneurysms or uncle herniation, it is a pupillary parasympathetic fibers which get affected first and therefore they present with dilatation of the pupil. So PCOM aneurysms can present with the third nerve palsy with pupillary dilatation. We have the, if there is an internal carotid artery in the cavernous sinus. So if there is an aneurysm in the cavernous sinus and if it ruptures, it can go and affect the sixth nerve. So if there is a presentation of sixth cranial nerve palsy, we think of the aneurysm of the cavernous sinus. If the anterior cerebral artery aneurysm is going and impinging, it goes and impinges the optic fibers and therefore it can cause visual field defects. So though subarachnoid hemorrhage usually presents with severe headache, the worst headache of my life and may not present with neurological deficits, there are certain aneurysms which can present with neurological deficits like PCOM aneurysm, posterior communicating artery aneurysm which presents with third nerve palsy especially pupillary involvement causing pupillary dilatation, the aneurysm in the cavernous sinus causing sixth nerve palsy and the aneurysm of the anterior cerebral artery which causes visual field defects. Right. So these are the very aneurysms which rupture and cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. But if the if because of hypertension, hypertension also can cause dilatation of the arteries which are known as the charcot duchart aneurysms. Here the aneurysms occur at the end arteries. The charcot duchart aneurysms, it is due to hypertension and there is a small dilatation of the vessel and the rupture can cause hypertensive bleed. So there are usually four common sites of hypertensive bleed. The commonest is putamen. So if we see hemorrhage in the putamen, pons, thalamus and cerebellum with a history of hypertension, it is usually a hypertensive bleed. So hypertensive bleed occurs in putamen, pons, thalamus and cerebellum. Chronic hypertension leads to the charcoal discharge aneurysm which can cause intracerebral hemorrhage. But these the subarachnoid hemorrhage is caused because of the very aneurysms which are present in the subarachnoid space. Right, this is about the these are the important concepts of subarachnoid hemorrhage. But then after some time there can be delayed neurological deficits of subarachnoid hemorrhage. For example, there can be re-rupture, especially within seven days. 
So to prevent the re-rupture and to control the hypertension, we usually give labetalol. And there can be hydrocephalus because of the obstruction or because of the absorption impairment, it could result in hydrocephalus. Third, there could be vasospasm because of the rupture, because of the blood products, they can go and irritate the vessels and can cause vasospasm. Very important complication of subperitoneal hemorrhage is vasospasm, usually seen between the 3 and 7 days and therefore we give calcium channel blocker nimodipin to prevent vasospasm. One of the important concepts is that subperitoneal hemorrhage after usually 3 to 7 days can cause vasospasm because of the irritants of the blood components on the vessel and therefore we give nimodipin to prevent the vasospasm and then there could be a delayed complication of hyponatremia. So how are we going to diagnose it? First and foremost, the first line investigation is non-contrast CT scan head. We all know that hemorrhage is better seen in CT scan than MRI and therefore the CT scan becomes the investigation of choice for hemorrhage that is subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we can see hemorrhage in the subarachnoid spaces, cisterns and ventricles. So non-contrast CT head is the investigation of choice. If you are not able to pick up, then we can do lumbar puncture because once we see, once we do lumbar puncture and take the CSF out, we can see the CSF are mixed with blood, uniformly stained blood. If it is traumatic tap, initially there will be blood, but in the later tubes, the blood comes down. But here they are uniformly mixed with blood and therefore in each tube, it, it occurs in equal amounts. So blood stained or blood tinged uh, CSF fluid and, and there can be cranial RBCs and then there are there is usually xanthochromia so when we centrifuge the CSF it gives an yellow coloration because of the degradation of hemoglobin into bilirubin products so xanthochromia crenated RBCs the blood present in all the three tubes equally is in favor of subarachnoid hemorrhage but if the blood is not seen equally in all the three tubes as it, it comes down in the in the uh, succeeding tubes and then if there is no xanthochromia and no crenated RBCs, it is in favor of a traumatic uh, lumbar puncture. And then uh, we take the help of neurosurgeons or neuroradiologists for treatment. So for to better delineate the aneurysm, the site of aneurysm, they may ask for cerebral angiogram. The treatment, if it is accessible surgically, surgeons can do surgical clipping. If it is in an inaccessible inaccessible region then we have to take the help of the neuroradiologist and then we have to go for endovascular coiling. From the neurologist's point we are worried about the complication of vasospasm which occurs usually after three days of subarachnoid hemorrhage and then we give nimodipin to prevent vasospasms. So these are the important concepts of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The one important question which we which we usually expect is severe worst sudden headache of my life and usually without neurological deficits but then post communicating artery aneurysm the anterior cerebral artery aneurysm aneurysm in cavernous sinus may present with neurological deficits so i hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel but please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts and my page dr srinivas concepts thank you bye